Chuck up here and see if I've got a story for you. You're like, yeah, I do. I do. I've got something for you later. I'm certain that you don't. Okay, it's so nice to see everybody else uh, welcoming and worshiping with us today. And um, I'd like you to know that we're having an annual congregational meeting on November the 21st. Um, the church meeting uh, will be after the service here on November the 21st. And it may take a few moments for us to do that because we have to wait for Reuben to arrive from his own church service. So mark that down on your calendar, November the 21st, our annual uh, congregational meeting to review the budget that we've set for next year. Also coming up, um, next Sunday we are going to be doing our Remembrance Day service. So keep that in mind. I know it's a little bit early for Remembrance Day, but it doesn't fall on Sunday. So we don't want to do it the day after, so we'll be doing it next Sunday. Also, next Sunday, we get an extra hour of sleep, so therefore we'll expect more people to show up because they can still sleep in and make it to church on time. I don't have anything more to add unless somebody else has something they'd like to offer. Okay, one more thing I want to add. I want to thank Dave for coming over here at night and turning the heat on in the church so we don't all freeze to death on, on Sunday morning. So thank you, Dave, for doing that. I appreciate that. Okay, Brian, it's your turn. Good morning. It's really good to see you here today. Um, we, uh, we should be praying for those folks who may be still on their way, like my wife, who is not here yet, and I'm a little concerned. <laughs> We're coming in, in two uh, separate cars recently because I have to get here quite a bit earlier to, to set up for, the, uh, for uh, recording the service. But anyway, I'm sure the Lord is going to look after her as he has always done. Isn't it nice to know that God is with our loved ones? wherever they may be. And uh, so we don't have to worry because they're in God's care. There's a verse I recall in, the, in Isaiah's prophecy that says, our, our names are engraved upon the hands of God. Well, that's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Not, not, not uh, not just written there in, with ink that can wear out and <clears throat> disappear. Our names are engraved on God's hands. And so always remember that. He, he loves us. And there she is right there. Hello, dear. <laughs> our prayers are answered. Let's begin our service today. Now we can. Call to worship. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Uh, let's stand together and sing How Great Thou Art. <laughs>
please be seated. We're going to work on uh, using the hymn books again, by the way. I'm, I'm going to beat some drums this week and, and, and see if we can get that done. I mean, if they, if they can fill out the Rogers Center, you know, for hockey games, uh, people sweating and drinking together <laughs> and having fun, uh, I don't know why we can't use hymn books here. What do you think, Mike? I got Mike's okay on that for sure. <laughs> well, we will we will work on that. We don't want to step on any governmental toes, that's for sure. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your presence now, knowing that you were here waiting for us. This is a place where you have been pleased to place your name. For 188 years. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you lit this candle and you have kept it aflame. Our prayer, <coughs> Lord, is you'll, <coughs> you'll help us to catch the flame. You'll help us to know what it feels like to be warm and on fire for you. We thank you that you've gathered us together here today. We thank you for everyone who's present here. And Lord, we pray for our families and our friends, our loved ones who are not here today. We pray for our community today. Lord, so many people are living in fear and, and living in darkness. And that was the case even before the pandemic. And it will still be the case after the pandemic is history. We thank you, Lord, that you are the light of the world. And you have called upon us to be the people of light. And so, Lord, we pray that those who see us will see that light shining in our face. They will hear it in our voice. They will, they will see it in what we do. But only, Lord, only you know how we think. And so we pray, Lord, that today you will help us to learn to think about things the way you do and indeed to see things the way you do to have your perspective and then lord maybe then maybe then we can actually learn what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves lord we do pray today for those who are in authority over us who are making tough decisions and none of us here would like to be in their shoes <laughs> to have that awesome responsibility no matter what they do no matter what they decide someone's going to criticize them i just did this morning so lord we do pray for them we pray that they will learn first and foremost that they are accountable to you it doesn't matter who who else they may feel that they are accountable to but lord help them to know that they're accountable to you you are watching over them your word tells us that those who are in authority over us are there because you have willed it to be so and we don't get that we don't understand that but lord once again we we need your perspective so lord help us to learn to pray more than we criticize <clears throat> and help us Lord to trust more than fret <laughs> and now Lord as your family together we pray the wonderful prayer Jesus taught us our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, we, we can't stand up. Well, I guess we, we could stand up and stretch if you want to, but we can certainly turn around and wave. And let's all wave, especially at Lach Lachlan and Lincoln. Hi, guys. It's so good. Do you remember us? 
We sure remember you. I'm glad you're here today. The kids are coming back. It's a good sign. There's light at the end of the tunnel for sure. Let's, uh, let's sing our, uh, our song of, uh, of peace. For you I pray God's peace that deep and constant rest It's children's time with Aunt Irene. Uh, Aunt Irene, how you want to do this? We haven't done this for such a long time. Well, I get, is it, uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll get my tongue back. Hey, Mom, do you want the, the boys to come up or do you want them to stay where they are? Oh, okay. I want bikes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs>
Are you going to keep them with you, Melody, or do you want to take them down? Okay. Veronica can go down with them if you want. Want to go down with that, day, Veronica? She'll take you downstairs. We haven't had the lights on downstairs for a long time. Oh, the time we turned them on. Here you go, guys. Great. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my soul, like David the shepherd, I sing. You know, this is a great hymn, and I sure wish I had the music in front of me so I could not mess up the melody. But I'm going to ask Irene to, uh, to uh, can you play it through for us so I'll, I'll remember? I love, the, I love the hymn, but I haven't heard it for a long time. so good. It's such a joy to sing uh, again, isn't it? Uh, Gary, will you please come and lead us in the readings today? Thank you. A responsive reading today comes from the Old Testament, the book of Jeremiah, chapter 18 verses 1 through 6. This is the word that came to Jerusalem, to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down to the potter's house, and there I will give you my message. So I went down to the potter's house, and I saw him working at the wheel. But the pot he was shaping from the clay was marred in his hands. So the potter formed it into another pot, shaping it as seemed best to him. Then the word of the Lord came to me. He said, Can I not do with you, Israel, as this potter does, declares the Lord. Like clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, Israel. Our New Testament readings today come from the book of Romans. Uh, there are two. The first is from Romans 11, verses 33 to 36, and our second is Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? 
Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This ends our readings for today. Thank you, Gary. Just a little preview of, of the sermon. The, the portion he read from Romans chapter 11 uh, comes right before the portion from Romans chapter 12. We put the chapter divisions in the Bible. The Lord didn't. So uh, more about that later. Spirit of the living God, let's stand together and sing this little chorus. <laughs> Well, good morning again. I, I turned the, the, pul the pulpit microphone on now, so maybe you can hear me better. <laughs> I forgot before. Oh, getting old is not a good thing. And, and they all said, amen, right? <laughs> well, we all know about the recent headlines and the tragic news about the residential schools. Who, who, who knew about it and, and who didn't? A and when? All I know is probably the same as you do. It was all news to me. I had never really heard about it in my whole life. Now, it was to say the least now, a horrible mistake for those who came up with the idea. And it's a heartbreaking tragedy for all the First Nations children and families who suffered and and many we hear say they are still suffering today. It's, it's horrible. Uh, my eldest niece Karen, I am very proud of Karen, um, Karen has been working in Northern Ontario for many years now with some of the uh, the First Nations women and children who are most at risk. Karen could tell a lot of stories and maybe I'll invite her here some uh, someday to fill us in. Um, because of Karen, I know firsthand that uh, breaking up families is the wrong way to go. Uh, what is needed is to make it possible 
for families to safely be together. Well, enough said about that. Uh, what I want us to think about now is, is not residential schools, but another kind of school that I do remember well from my boyhood. And uh, these schools no longer exist either. They were called reform schools. How many of you know that term? Yeah. Uh, do you know there were 13 of them in Ontario? I did not know that. I looked it up. Uh, they started from 1953, and they existed until 1984. Uh, of course, not much is said about them nowadays, but there is no doubt that some of the boys and girls in those schools were also physically, sexually, and psychologically abused. As a matter of fact, there are cases before the courts right now as recently as September of this year. But of course, those have not made the headlines. By the way, speaking of not making the headlines, it is a fact. I can give you the documentation if you're interested. It is a fact that every day, worldwide, 13 Christians are killed because of their faith. Every day, 12 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. And every day, 12 Christians are unjustly arrested or imprisoned, and another five are abducted. That's the 2021 World Watch List. Now, did you know that? No. But of course, we don't know it because it's not happening in North America. It's happening overseas. So because it's not happening here, no one in the news media cares. And besides, it's just Christians. It's okay to persecute them, isn't it? When's the last time you heard the name of the Lord Jesus Christ used as a swear word? Yesterday? This morning? You hear it every day. Well, as I said, that's just by the way. <laughs> now getting back to the topic of reform. Uh, when that name reform, uh, this is Reformation Sunday, you saw that in the first slide. When that name reform or reformation is mentioned, we all kind of get a queasy feeling uh, inside, at least I know I do. Uh, <laughs> maybe because back when I was a kid, uh, there were reform schools. Remember I said they started in 1953? Well, I was born in 1947, so when I was in public school, we knew all about reform schools and we thought they were a joke. Um, because our parents would say things like, if you don't behave, we'll send you to reform school. Now, how many of your parents said that to you? You're so perfect. <laughs> so angelic. So pure Presbyterian. Wow. Well, I heard it anyway. Uh, but we knew it wasn't true. It was all a joke. Uh, reform school was for the bad guys. Well, I remember as a kid on my street growing up, uh, I know I remember well. Now, in case he's still alive for privacy's sake, uh, I'll call this kid Jimmy Jones. He was older than me, but we went to the same school uh, now, there was no need for, for school buses because we could walk there in less than 10 minutes. Uh, can kids still walk for 10 minutes today without needing transportation? I, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, anyway, now, I, I too was the good kid. Uh, I went to church every Sunday. I sang in the choir. Actually, I had no choice. My mother was the church organist and my father was the Sunday school superintendent. Go to church or don't eat. You know, that was about it. Uh, so compared to the other kids, because I, I went to church every Sunday and was brought up by very strict parents, uh, I, I was innocent and, and oh so naive. I would hear swear words and didn't know what they meant. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, Jimmy Jones, now he was the bad kid. 
I'll never forget the first time he got me in a headlock <laughs> on the way home from school. I cried like a baby, and all the other kids laughed at me. I guess that's why I still remember it. I remember how embarrassed I was. But there was another day at school we all noticed that Jimmy wasn't in the playground. And later we heard he had been sent to reform school. You don't know what he did bad, but enough to get him sent there. Uh, I, I don't suppose it was because of the headlock, huh? No, I probably was something worse than that. <laughs> anyway, but <laughs> I know must get to the topic. Uh, I'm not talking about institutional, residential, or reform schools that thankfully no longer exist. So what is it I want to talk about this morning? By the way, do you like the picture? How many of you were brought up in a classroom that looked exactly like that? The, the, the desks were all bolted down to the... That was my school, anyway. <laughs> but I think that's a little older than whatever. Uh, so what am I talking about this morning? Well, here's a hint. You are in it. Not a residential school, not a reform school. What I want to talk about is what you are in, and that's church. <laughs> you're here this morning, and you're, you're in the church, and we're all part of the body of Christ, and we're so thankful for that. Now, I want us to, to, to concentrate on the first part of that last verse in today's text. That would be Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. Did you notice it says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I heard of a minister uh, who starts each confirmation class with a jar full of jelly beans. He asks uh, the, the class to, to guess how many jelly beans are in the jar, and then on a big pad of paper, he, he writes down all the estimates. And then on that same pad of paper, he asks all the kids for their favorite songs. And so he writes them down beside the, the guesses for the jelly beans. So when, when the, uh, the lists are complete, he reveals the actual number of jelly beans and, and everybody, you know, everybody claps and he gives them a prize. And we do that too. Whenever we have our, our chili suppers, anyway, it's fun. But then he turns to the list of the favorite songs and uh, so he says to them, well, you know how many jelly beans there are, but which one of these song titles is closest to being right? Now, the students protest that there is no right answer. It's all a matter of personal taste. And then the minister asks them this question. Remember, it's a confirmation class. They're there to confirm their faith in the Lord Jesus. So he says, when you decide what to believe in terms of your faith, is that more like guessing the number of jelly beans or more like choosing your favorite song? Now, he says he always gets the same answer. Choosing your faith is more like choosing a favorite song. Maybe that's why there's so many churches today, huh? So when the class ended and the minister was telling the story, one of the elders uh, asked him, so after they, they say that, do you still confirm them? And he answered, well, first I try to argue them out of it. <laughs> It's all a matter of choices, isn't it? We all have three choices in this life. We can choose to conform, we can choose to reform, or, as we'll find out, we can choose, we can choose to be transformed. Now, the first choice is conform. Now, the, the scripture is very clear and very blunt. It's a command. And uh, it says, well, it says actually, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Now, that's, that is a command. You know, just like the thou shalt not in the Ten Commandments. Now, the second choice is reform. So this is Reformation Sunday. And we all know back in 1517, you all remember that, right? 
504 years ago, Martin Luther shook the established church to its foundations. He, it was a nonviolent rebellion, happened in the German city of Worms, and it resulted in the Reformation. Now, what was the Reformation all about? Well, it, it, uh, it really did shake the very foundations of the church. And actually, what it did, it, it sought to replace that foundation with what we now know as the five foundation pillars of the Protestant Reformation. And by the way, on those five pillars, on that foundation, this church stands today. And we will not budge from those pillars. Now, uh, this, this past week, one of you not knowing what, exactly what I was gonna say today, uh, emailed me the definition. Now, it, it thrills me to know that, that uh, there are folks in our congregation that are doing a little studying. <laughs> and uh, so thank you for sending this. And, and so the, what are the five pillars? Well, the first one is sola scriptura. They're all in Latin, 500 years ago, remember? Sola scriptura, which means scripture alone. In other words, scripture, the word of God is the highest authority of the truth. Not what some individual says, not what somebody comes up with later. The scriptures as we have them are the highest authority of the truth. The second pillar is sola Christus, which means Christ alone. Salvation is only possible through Christ Jesus. Now that's really being attacked today. Well, you have your religion, I have my religion, and you think you're right, and, and I think I'm right, and you know, it all, it all, we all believe in the same God, and you know, you heard it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus said that. The Apostle Peter said, there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we can be saved. Jesus Christ. I'm not going to budge from that. I don't care if that's popular or not. Jesus said he's the only way. Sola gratia, which means grace alone. Salvation is through grace alone, and it is not as a reward of our merits. How many people have got messed up today trying to earn their way to heaven and deciding who is good enough and who's not good enough. Romans chapter 3 says, there is none righteous. <laughs> no, not one. Sola fide, faith alone. Now, that's a big one. God's grace is transmitted to the believer by the gift of faith. That is the truth. Faith is a gift. You cannot conjure it up. Two people can be given the same evidence and come up with different conclusions. Faith is a gift from the Spirit of God. Finally, the fifth pillar is this, soli deo gloria, which means for the glory of God alone. The reason we are saved, it's a good word, the reason we are saved is that so that we can glorify God. Too many preachers today are glorifying themselves. You could name them and so could I, and not just preachers. So it's all very clear, the five pillars, and I believe it's 100% right, and I believe if we ever deviate from that, we are in deep trouble. Now today there's a different kind of reformation going on in many Protestant churches. Now this gets closer to home. And you know, there are many churches today and, and you know, I, it's hard to argue with it. They naturally wish to reach more people and grow in numbers. Now, would you like to do that too? Would you like to reach more people and grow in numbers? Would you like to do that by compromising one of the five pillars of our faith? No. Well, hang on. Uh, in order to reach that goal, for, for several decades now, uh, many churches have been doing basically four things. They see a new perspective. 
In other words, a need to reflect what is happening in the culture. The culture changes and so must we. Well, the message never changes. Our, our methods can change, yes. Maybe we, there are some things we could tweak. <laughs> anyway, the second thing is this, that churches try to do. Having decided they need a new perspective, they then decide on new policies in order to support that new perspective. Then they go ahead and they develop new plans to support the new policies. And finally, they implement new programs to support the new plans. So, you know, I'm not here today to tell any other churches what to do. I would never do that. Um, but for me, personally, I tend to shy away from human efforts to make church growth happen. I, I, I have tried it, believe me, I've been around a long time. I have tried it and been involved in churches who have tried it to no avail. Now, I, I think of it a, a sort of a picture of a steel pond. I want you to picture a steel pond. You know, not, not a stagnant pond, mind you, with, with green slime on, on the top and, you know, smelly, uh, but a crystal clear pond reflecting the light as the sun rises over the horizon. Got that picture? Beautiful picture. It's bright and quiet and calm and it's peaceful, a wonderful sight to see. And that's, that's how I see our church. It, it is beautiful. But you know what? I don't think it's the way that we're meant to be. In fact, I feel strongly that's not how God wants us to be. We need to be prepared to be stirred up a bit without compromising. <laughs> However, if, you know, if, we, if we decided to go along and, and act on perceived cultural problems by taking a new perspective and developing new policies and making new plans and running new programs, uh, it would be a futile effort. It would be like someone standing by that still pristine pond and tossing a, tossing a big rock into the middle. You know what would happen? There'd be a big splash, and there'd be big waves, but the end result would be what? A still, pristine pond. Well, it might be a little muddier. <laughs> but in effect, nothing will have really changed. And so, what shall we do? Shall we just go along week after week doing the same thing all over again? I, people say it was Einstein, who allegedly said, whether he said it or not, I think it's true, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Do you ever watch reruns and hope there'll be a different ending? <laughs> so what do we do then? Do we do nothing? Well, the first choice, remember we all have, we have choices, the first choice is conform. But wait a minute, the scripture says, do not conform to the pattern of the world around us. Now, is that clear or not? Do not conform to the pattern of the world around us. The second choice is reform. But as I've tried to help us to see today, that could be just pretty futile to do that. Now the third choice, and I believe it is the only choice, is transformation. Now let's look at Romans 12, verse 2 again. We already read the first part. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and to prove what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, transforming anything takes a lot of courage, a lot of work. We're in the process right now of, of trying to transform Veronica's parents' house. Um, they were very, very old fashioned, very European. And we brought, brought a real estate agent in to, we're still going through probate by the way, we 
scrip who knows when the house will actually go on the market, but actually it's a blessing disguised because the real estate agent said, whoa, you can't sell it like this. So she gave us a list of the things that had to be done. And there were a lot of things, a lot of expensive things that needed to be done. So when it's all done, it's going to be transformed. But you know what? After that transformation is done, do you know how much the house is going to be worth? exactly the same amount as it was before the transformation was done. The transformation just helps to make it easier to sell. Because houses are going like, a, it's within spitting distance of square one. It's worth a lot of money, no matter what condition it's in. So that's the way it's gonna be. Transformation takes a lot of courage, a lot of work, and it takes a lot of risk as well. But when it comes to transforming people, now there is a problem. It doesn't work. Boy, I've tried it. It doesn't work. Now, when it comes to a church where there's a, a lot of people, <laughs> uh, it all depends on that lot of people. All of that, all of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, having tried it, the results are usually discouraging. Now, I, I've been in church leadership either as as a minister, as a pastor, or as a, a, a leader uh, for well over 50 years, I've, I, I've, never, I've never been silent. <laughs> I've always been sort of out there. And being in leadership is no fun, by the way. And one of the, one of the, uh, the problems with, with, uh, with being in a leadership position is, first of all, is anyone following? <laughs> and the second thing is when things don't go well, discouragement sets in, and discouragement is the one word that can kill a church. It can kill, it can kill you, it can kill me. Discouragement. Discouragement can make us quit. So, after we have done our best, if I were to take a poll and ask you who have been around here longer than, than I have, most of you have been around here all of your lives. Have you done your best to help Union Church to be the best it can be? And I think all of you would say, yeah, we really, we've really done our best. And I've heard all the stories and I believe them, they're all true. And boy, this, this church was, was really something back in the day. So after you've done your best and now look at us today and you say, okay, what's the alternative then? What do we do? Okay, when it comes to choosing not to conform to the culture, that depends on the individual. Each one has to make their own decision. You choose every day not to conform to the culture. It's your choice, and no one can make that choice for you. Now the same goes for, for that word reform. It's your choice. It's my choice. You choose to reform yourself. You are the one who chooses to make drastic changes in your life, and only you can make that choice. But here's the thing, and this makes me smile. Transformation, when it comes to people, transformation does not depend on you. And it does not depend on me, and it doesn't depend on any church leader. Transformation all depends on God. Now, did you get that from the verse? didn't say transform yourself, did it? What did it say? All together. Be transformed. Say it. Be transformed. God is saying to you today, and he's saying to me, son, daughter, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. Learn to think like me, God says and not like yourself. I like the way I think. <laughs> Be transformed. Did I say it takes courage? It does. People, as I said, they don't transform themselves or anyone else. Only God can do that. You know, in, in, in accomplishing that transformation, if you're wondering why our responsive reading this morning was from Jeremiah chapter 18, remember the, the story? The potter makes, makes the pot and and it's, it's 
flawed and so he crushes it down into powder again and he makes it again. So, so the reason I chose that is that I like to think that those hands upon whom our names are engraved because he loves us so much, those same hands aren't afraid to get dirty. <laughs> He's going to keep on reshaping us, reforming us, remolding us until we're the way he wants us to be because he knows that's best for us. That way we'll be the most useful. <laughs> A pot isn't useful to itself. It's useful to others, right? <laughs> and that's what it's all about. That's why God is making us like his son. And you know what? God is simply never going to give up on us. Doesn't matter how old we are, he's never going to give up on us. All that God needs, you say, God can do anything. Yes, he can. But he needs your willingness to be transformed, and he needs mine. It says, be transformed. So we, we have a choice. No. 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 Or we can say, yes, Lord. Change me. It cannot ha happen collectively. It starts with me, with each person in this sanctuary. One day back in the 1930s, at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, London, a communist was speaking, and he said, democracy is a failure. Only Marx and Lenin, only communism can put a new suit on every man. He was immediately in interrupted by a frail old Ang Anglican clergyman who shouted back, maybe so, but only Jesus Christ can put a new man in every suit. <laughs> Amen. 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 All God needs is our willingness to be transformed. It starts with me and with all of you as well. I said it starts with me. Amen. Well, we're still uh, not taking up the off off offering, but you know where the collection plates are. But we can thank God. Let's stand together and sing the doxology. <laughs> Stand up, we're already standing up. Stand up and bless the Lord, let's sing together.
may the Lord bless you and keep you safe. May his, his light shine down upon you and may it shine forth from within you and may you be a blessing to everyone you meet this week. And they all said together, Amen. If you feel that you can, then we're going to meet downstairs today to have a little coffee and, and refreshment together. There's plenty of room down there to keep so to maintain social distancing. If you don't feel you, that you can, that's quite all right. But it's just too cold to go outside anymore. So uh, let, let's try to transition back into it as best we can. Thank you. <laughs>